Part four of The Giant Crab and Other Tales from Old India, retold by W. H. D. Rouse. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part four. The Quail and the Falcon. Pride must have a fall. The Bold Beggar. The Jackal would a wooing go. The Lion and the Boar. The Goblin City. Black Nose. The King's Lesson. The Quail and the Falcon there once was a young quail that lived on a farm when the farmer ploughed up the land quaily used to hop about over the clods and pick up seeds or weeds or worms or anything that the plough turned up and he ate these and lived on them you might think this was very nice for him he had no trouble to find food because the ploughman turned it up he had only to hop along after the plough and peck not a bit of it he must needs better himself as he said so one fine day he flew away over the farm away to the forest which fringed it and alighting on the ground just where the forest began he looked about to see if there was anything good to eat up in the air just above the tree-tops a falcon was sailing poised on outstretched wings as quaily searched for worms so the falcon was searching for quails and lo and behold he spied one down he came with a swoop and a whirr and in an instant the quail was in his crooked claws what could poor quaily do now he twittered and fluttered and at last began to cry oh dear oh dear whimpered quaily the tears running down his beak what a fool i was to poach on other people's preserves if i had only stayed at home this falcon could never have caught me not even if he had come and tried what's that quaily asked the falcon do you think i can't catch you anywhere not on my own ground cried the quail what do you mean by that a ploughed field full of clods oh nonsense quaily clods won't help you just try off you go i'll follow the quail flew off feeling as happy now as he was miserable a moment gone and when he got back to his farm he picked out a big clod and perched on the top come on falcon cried he come on down came the falcon with a swoop like a flash of lightning but just as he came close the quail dodged him nimbly and tumbled over the clod to the other side leaving the falcon to come full tilt against the clod of earth and so swift was he that the shock killed him so the quail found out how much better it is for most people to stick to what they are used to and as for the falcon he might have thought if he had been able to think at all that a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush pride must have a fall once upon a time there was a beautiful wild goose that lived in the mountains he was king of the geese and he had a mate and two or three fine young ones but it had happened once that this goose in his travels about the world fell in with a young lady crow who was very pretty as black as jet with two eyes like black beads and she flirted and flouted so enchantingly that he had married her like the goose he was so he had two wives the little black crow and the goose in course of time this crow laid a beautiful egg all white with blue spots and twice as big as an ordinary crow's egg she was very proud of her egg and sat on it for a long time until one day pop went the egg and out came a funny little chick the crow did not know what to make of this chick he was not black as she was and he was not white like his father but something betwixt and between a dingy gray with brown streaks so she named him streaky be sure that streaky fancied himself mightily being so very different from all the crows he lived with he was larger to begin with and then he had a very loud voice with several different notes in it not to mention his brown streaks which made him a proud bird indeed and i think the other crows took him at his own price as foolish creatures are apt to do and thought him very wonderful though he was really only a mongrel now the goose his father used to pay a visit to the crow colony now and again flying down from the mountains to the dust heap where they lived outside the city gate 
but he did not stay long because the crows used to feed on offal and dead bodies in fact anything dirty they could find and king goose could not get what he liked to eat well once as he was talking to his sons the young geese they asked him why he was always going away for days at a time why he said i go to see a son of mine that lives somewhere else oh how nice said the geese then he must be our brother do let us bring him here on a visit do father at first the father goose would not let them go for fear of mischief but after a while he was persuaded and gave them very careful directions how to fly and where to go and how to find the place where streaky lived on the top of a tall palm tree that grew out of a dust heap at the city gate so away they flew and away they flew till at last they saw the tall palm tree and on the very top of it a big nest and in the nest a little black crow and our funny friend streaky they said how do you do and told their errand because they meant to go through with it now although they did not much like the look of this ugly bird streaky with his airs and graces mrs crow was very much pleased but streaky looked bored and said ah caw i don't think i can fly all that way it is really too much trouble why did not the governor come to see me instead as usual ma this rude bird called his father the governor you see as he had been brought up among carrion crows his manners were not of the best the young geese began to like him less than ever however they put a good face on it and answered him well streaky if you are as weak as all that we will carry you on a stick these geese were very big strong birds and they thought nothing of carrying streaky so they looked about until they found a strong stick and then each of them took an end in his mouth and streaky perched in the middle they could not say good-bye to mrs crow because their mouths were full of the stick but they made her a nice bow like polite little geese and flew off as for streaky he was far too full of his own importance to say good-bye to his mother or even so much as thank you to the two birds who were so kindly carrying him there he sat on the middle of the stick as proud as punch pluming his feathers and feeling that now all the world would see what a splendid bird he was as they flew over the city streaky looked down and saw the king of the city in a beautiful carriage drawn by four white thoroughbreds driving round the city in great state and grandeur aha thought he that's as it should be but i'm every bit as good as he and in his joy he began to sing a little song which he made up on the spur of the moment and here is his song as yonder king goes galloping with his milk-white four in hand streaky has these his pair of geese to carry him over the land the geese were very angry when they heard streaky sing this song but they were very well-bred geese as you must have seen already so they said nothing at all to him then but carried him safely to their home and then they told their father what streaky had said so that he might do as he thought best old king goose was more angry than they were and was very sorry he had left his son to be brought up by a crow who knew no manners so he called streaky and this is what he said streaky you have been very rude to your brothers who are at least as good as you and if you think they are like a pair of horses to be driven about for your pleasure you make a great mistake so the best thing you can do is to fly back to your mother for your manners suit the dust heap better than the mountains i don't know whether streaky was ashamed of what he had said creatures like streaky are very thick-skinned and it takes a great deal to make them ashamed but anyhow he had to go back and this time he must fly by himself for it was hardly likely that his brothers would carry him when he had been so rude he got back a few days later tired and hungry and spent the rest of his days on the dust heap eating carrion what his mother thought of it all i don't know but king goose never went to see him any more the bold beggar there was once a king who was so fond of good eating and drinking that they called him king dainty he often spent as much as a thousand pounds on a single dish 
which is great wastefulness when you can dine heartily for a shilling he thought that if people could not eat things so nice as his yet they must greatly enjoy seeing him eat them so he fitted up a beautiful tent outside his own door and there he took his meals sitting on a golden throne under a white silk umbrella anybody who liked could see him eat his dinner without charge this was very generous wasn't it a man who had often seen him eat thought he would like a taste of the king's choice food and this is what he did he came running towards the crowd who as usual were watching the king eat his dinner and shouted news 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 now at that time there were no newspapers and no posts and no telegraphs so any one who brought news was sure of instant hearing accordingly the crowd made way for him at once and he ran up to the king looking very much excited and shouting news then he fell down before the king as if he were faint with hunger and gasped poor fellow said the king give him something to eat so they propped him up on a chair and the king fed him out of his own dish and gave him delicious wine to drink the man made a hearty meal i can tell you they thought he would never finish but he did finish at last after an hour or two then the king said to him now my good fellow let us hear your news the news is your majesty said the man that an hour ago i was hungry and now i am not all the people looked shocked at his impertinence but the king only laughed and said that news is true of most of us every day of our lives well you are a bold fellow this time you may go free but i advise you not to try it again the man bowed low and went away happy in the success of his trick i don't know whether the king spent less money upon his dinner after that but i am quite sure that no one else got a meal at his table in the same way the jackal would a wooing go once upon a time there was a family of lions that lived in the himalaya mountains in a golden cave they were three brothers and one sister nearby was a silver mountain with a crystal cave and in this crystal cave lived a jackal the young lions used to be out all day hunting while their sister kept everything neat and tidy at home when they caught anything they used to keep a bit for her because they were not greedy lions and they thought that if she did the work at home she deserved some of the game they got abroad now this jackal fell violently in love with the young lioness she was very beautiful with soft brown fur and large soft eyes and fine whiskers and he did not stop to think what a mongrel cur a jackal looks beside a lion how small and sneaking and snarling so that it was the height of impertinence even to think of such a thing he did think of it and more he actually proposed to the lioness you shall hear how he did it he had the sense to wait until the three brothers had gone out hunting for food and then he came and tapped on the rock at the mouth of the golden cave the lioness looked out and very much surprised was the lioness to see the jackal there she knew him by sight of course as a neighbor and indeed when he was in his crystal cave you could always see him perched up in the air as it might be for you can see through crystal like glass and it looked just as if there were nothing there but they were not on visiting terms so the lioness was surprised to see him come tapping at her door she gave him a distant bow and waited beautiful lioness said he i love you how much we are alike you have four feet and so have i clearly we are made for one another will you marry me we shall be happy together this offer so astonished the lioness that she could say nothing she hated the vile creature vilest of all creatures that he should dare to address himself to a royal lioness a scavenger to a queen the very thought of the insult made her furious she resolved that after such a thing as that had spoken to her she might just as well die either by holding her breath or by starving herself as these thoughts passed through her mind the jackal was waiting for his answer but no answer he got this seemed a pretty broad hint that he was not wanted there 
so he went home again, very woe-begone, with his tail between his legs, and lay down in his crystal cave in much misery. By and by the eldest brother of the lioness came home again with a fine fat deer which he had killed. Here, sister, he called out, have a bit. She put on a very gloomy air. No, she said, I think I shall have to die. Why, what on earth is the matter? asked he. A nasty, dirty jackal came and wanted to marry me. The brute, said her brother. Where is he? Can't you see him lying up in the sky? You know, the crystal was transparent, and as she had never been there, she could not tell he was really in a cave. Off galloped the young lion, furious with rage, and when he got near the place where the jackal was lying in his crystal cave, he leaped at him when a crack! went his skull against the wall of crystal, and down fell the lion, dead. Just as the lioness was getting anxious about her eldest brother, the second came in. She told him the same tale, though she was beginning to be sorry that she was going to die. He had not hurt her, after all, and how nice the meat smelt. But the second lion did not give her much time to think. He growled, and off he went, leaped into the air, cracked his crown against the wall of crystal, and fell down dead beside his brother. Now, when the third brother came in, the lioness was quite sure she didn't mean to die. However, she looked as gloomy as ever, and told her brother what had happened. He had better go out and see what was become of the other two. Surely two lions were a match for any jackal. Still, there he was, as before, up in the air. Up in the air? said the youngest brother, who was cleverer than all the rest put together. Stuff and nonsense! Now, let me think, there must be something for him to lie upon, and yet you can see through it. He scratched his head with one paw, and looked wise. I have it! Crystal, of course, or glass, that's what it is. So up he jumped, and when he got near the crystal cave, there were his two brothers, dead, with their skulls cracked right across like a teacup. He sat down again and scratched his head with the other paw. Hmm, it looks as though it may be difficult to get at this jackal. However, I'll try kindness first. Jackie, Jackie dear, he called out. Now you must know that lions have a very loud voice, and if you have heard them talking in the zoo, you will know that even when they want to coax and purr, they are enough to frighten you. And so the poor jackal, who after all was not so bad as the proud lioness made out, when he heard the lion coaxing him down, thought, what an awful roar! His heart was beating very hard before, but this time it gave such a leap that something went snap, and the jackal was dead too. Then the lion looked up, and saw that the jackal was dead, so he buried his brothers and went and told his sister all about it. You might expect her to be sorry that her two brave brothers were dead, all because she held her nose so high in the air. But not a bit of it. She was quite satisfied, so long as one was left to catch food for her. So she lived all the rest of her life in the golden cave, but I never heard that any other animal asked her to marry him. THE LION AND THE BOAR Once upon a time there was a lion who lived in the mountains, and he used to drink water out of a beautiful lake. It so happened that as he was drinking there one day he saw a boar feeding over on the opposite bank. Now he had just eaten a leg of elephant and was not hungry, but he made a note of that boar, thinking to himself what a nice meal the boar would make some other day. So, after drinking his fill, he crawled quietly away through the bushes, hoping that the boar would not see him. But the boar had sharp eyes, and did see him. Hello, he said to himself, yon lion is afraid of me, that's clear. Ah, well, he need not think to get off so easy. If he wants to go, he must fight me first. He puffed his chest out, very big, and rubbed his tusks against a tree, and then he called out, Stay, stay, run away, let us have a fight today. You have four feet, so have I. If you fail, you can but try. The lion could hardly believe his ears. 
What? A boar challenge him to fight? He could break a boar's back with a tap of his paw. Still, he hid his astonishment at this impertinent boar, and said only, uh, Please, Mr. Boar, let me off to-day, as I'm rather tired. I have just been wrestling with a fox. But if you like, I will meet you here this day week, and then we can fight it out between us. He said this so humbly that the boar became haughtier than ever. Oh, well, very well, said he. It shall never be said I took a mean advantage of any one. This day week, then. Good day to you. When he got home, his friends hardly knew him. Every bristle on his back was standing up straight. His little greedy eyes were gleaming. He ran into the house, knocking over the pots and pans, snarling at his wife, and making himself very disagreeable indeed. At last the other boars protested and said they would not stand it any longer. Ho, ho, says he, you defy a boar that has killed a lion. Come on, then. And very fierce indeed he looked. Killed a lion? They did open their eyes. Where is the lion you have killed? asked a pretty little sow, full of curiosity. Well, I haven't exactly killed him yet, said the boar rather unwillingly. He is coming to be killed this day week. What on earth do you mean? his friends asked. He told them the story, but he did not feel quite so bold now as he had felt before. And when he finished he felt worse than ever for one and all they set up such a weeping and wailing that the whole forest resounded with it oh dear oh dear they cried you'll be the death of us kill a lion why he will crunch you up in a trice and then he'll come here and we are all dead boars by this time the poor little boar had lost all his conceit you see he was an ignorant boar and did not know at all what the strength of a lion is so his heart was down in his toes, and all he wanted now was some way out of the mischief. Nobody could think of a way, until one very old and wise boar advised him to roll in the mud till he was very dirty, because lions are clean beasts and do not like dirt. So every day he rolled and wallowed in the dirtiest places he could find, and by the appointed time he was like a big cake of dirt. So when he came to the lake where he was to meet the lion, the wind took a whiff of him to the lion, and the lion gave a jump, and snuffed, and sneezed, and swished his tail, and cried out, Get to leeward, get to leeward! Here's a pretty trick. Well, you have saved your life. I would not touch you with a pair of tongs now. And in great disgust he went away, saying, as he went, this little rhyme. Dirty boar, I want no more, you're safe from being eaten. If you would fight, I yield me quite, and own that I am beaten. You may be sure that our friend the boar did not wait any longer, but scampered off home. But when he got there, I am sorry to say, he told all his friends that he had beaten the lion, and the lion had run away. He certainly had beaten the lion in one way, but not in a fair fight so it was rather mean to pretend he had. However, nobody believed him, and the colony of boars thought the best thing they could do was to get away from that place as fast as their four legs could carry them. If he is beaten, said they with a wink, still, after all, he is a lion. The Goblin City Long, long ago, in the island of Ceylon, there was a large city full of nothing but goblins. They were all she-goblins, too, and if they wanted husbands, they used to get hold of travelers and force them to marry, and afterwards, when they were tired of their husbands, they gobbled them up. One day a ship was wrecked upon the coast near the goblin city, and five hundred sailors were cast ashore. The she-goblins came down to the seashore and brought food and dry clothes for the sailors and invited them to come into the city. There was nobody else there at all, but for fear that the sailors should be frightened away, the goblins, by their magic power, made shapes of people appear all around so that there seemed to be men ploughing in the fields or shepherds tending their sheep and huntsmen with hounds and all the sights of the quiet country life. So when the sailors looked round and saw everything as usual, they felt quite secure, 
although, as you know, it was all a sham. The end of it was that they persuaded the sailors to marry them, telling them that their own husbands had gone to sea in a ship, and had been gone these three years, so that they must be drowned and lost forever. But really, as you know, they had served others in just the same way, and their last batch of husbands were then in prison, waiting to be eaten. In the middle of the night, when the men were all asleep, the she-goblins rose up, put on their hats, and hurried down to the prison. There they killed a few men, and gnawed their flesh, and ate them up, and after this orgy they went home again. It so happened that the captain of the sailors woke up before his wife came home, and not seeing her there, he watched. By and by, in she came. He pretended to be asleep, and looked out of the tail of his eye. She was still munching and crunching, and as she munched she muttered, "'Man's meat, man's meat, that's what goblins like to eat.' She said it over and over again, then lay down, and soon she was snoring loudly. The captain was horribly frightened to find he had married a goblin. What was he to do? They could not fight with goblins, and they were in the goblin's power. If they had a ship, they might have sailed away, because goblins hate the water worse than a cat, but their ship was gone. He could think of nothing. However, next morning he found a chance of telling his mates what he had discovered. Some of them believed him, and some said he must have been dreaming. They were sure their wives would not do such a thing. Those who believed him agreed that they would look out for a chance of escape but there was a kind of fairy who hated those goblins and she determined to save the men so she told her flying horse to go and carry them away and accordingly as the men were out for a walk next day the captain saw in the air a beautiful horse with large white and gold wings the horse fluttered down and hovered just above them crying out in a human voice who wants to go home who wants to go home who wants to go home i do i do called the sailors climb up then said the horse dropping within reach so one climbed up and then another and another and although the horse looked no bigger than any other horse there was room for everybody on his back i think that somehow when they got up the fairy made them shrink small till they were no bigger than so many ants and thus there was plenty of room for all when all who wanted to go had got up on his back away flew the beautiful horse and took them safely home as for those who remained behind that very night the goblins set upon them and mangled them and munched them to mincemeat lacked nose there was once a gardener who had no nose and he had a very nice garden full of beautiful flowers roses and pinks and lilies and violets and all the prettiest flowers you can imagine three little boys thought they would like a bunch of flowers but they did not know how to get it so one of them went into the garden and said good morning mr lacknose good morning boy said the gardener the boy thought the best thing he could do was to flatter the old fellow so he had made up a verse of poetry that he thought very pretty, and he said to the gardener, Cut and cut and cut again, hair and whiskers grow amain, and your nose will grow like these, give me a little posy, please. The gardener knew very well that his nose would not grow again like his whiskers, and he thought the little boy rather rude to mention it, so he became angry. Go away! said he and get your posy somewhere else the boy went away disappointed but the second boy thought he would try his luck too perhaps the first boy had not spoken nicely and he made a verse of poetry too which he thought would just suit the old gardener so in he came with good morning mr lacknose good morning boy said the old man and what do you want then the boy put on a coaxing smile and said in the autumn seeds are sown and ere long they're fully grown may your nose sprout up like these give me a little posy please there he thought the old fellow will like that because he is a gardener but not a bit of it the gardener saw through his trick and was angrier than ever be off said he or i'll be after you with a stick 
plant a nose indeed you had better go somewhere and learn manners before you ask for my flowers so the second boy went away faster than the first but the third boy was an honest little boy and knew that there is nothing like the truth so he determined to try what truth could do he walked modestly into the garden and said good morning sir what another of em growled the gardener to himself another pack of lies i suppose he would hardly look at the boy but the boy nothing daunted repeated his verse babbling fools to think that they could get a posy in this way say they yes or say they no noses cut no more will grow see i ask you honestly give a posy sir to me the gardener was so pleased to find a straightforward and honest little boy that he took his scissors and cut a most beautiful bunch of flowers which he gave the boy with a smile the boy said oh, thank you sir very much and went away delighted the king's lesson once upon a time there lived a very good king whose name was godfrey of course when a man is king everybody is ready to call him good but this king really was good he used to hold courts of justice for people to come to when they had a quarrel and he decided all the cases so wisely that nobody durst bring an unjust cause before him so after a while the result was that the courts became empty all the rustle and bustle was quiet the wigs and gowns were hung up on pegs and as dusty as dusty could be and nobody had any quarrels at all what a blessing thought king godfrey to himself now we have a little peace and they say it's all my doing i wonder if i am really as good as people make me out suppose i try to see no sooner said than done with this king he asked one and he asked another he begged and prayed them to tell him of his faults so that he might mend them but no they said they really could not tell him of his faults when he had none to tell of he tried in the palace he tried in the city high and low to and fro it was just the same all praise and no blame well upon my word thought the king i had no idea i was such a good fellow still who knows what they say behind my back happy thought i'll disguise myself and that will soon show me the truth so he dressed himself like a traveller and got a carriage and pair and drove all over the country asking everybody what they thought of the king wonder of wonders they said the same behind his back as they did to his face that must have been a very nice country to live in but i am sure i cannot tell where it is now in such a strange country as that strange things will happen and so it turned out that as our king was driving along he came to a narrow lane sunk between two steep banks and with only just room for the carriage and right in the middle of this lane another carriage met him there they stood both of them and neither would budge our king did not know who was in that carriage but i will tell you who it was this was the king of the next country who was also a good king as a king's go though not so good as the first and he had got the same idea into his head that he would wander about in disguise and find out what people thought of him everybody had a good word for him too it seems and if he found no one to pick faults in him before here was one now as you shall see get out of the way said the driver of the other carriage get out of the way yourself said king godfrey's man i have a king inside said he you see he knew who the disguised traveller was and he thought there was no need to hide it now when it might save him trouble if you have one king i have another said the other man and imagine how astonished king godfrey's coachman was to hear that oh dear oh dear he said what is to be done both kings how old is your king he added suddenly hoping you see that the younger might be willing to give way fifty fifty so is mine and how rich is he but it turned out they were just the same in that point 
and though he cudgelled his brains to find out some difference there seemed to be none their kingdoms were exactly the same size with exactly the same number of people in them and their ancestors had been just as brave and glorious in peace or war in fact they were as like as two peas in a pod all this time the horses were champing their bits and pawing the ground as if they would like to jump over each other's heads and i dare say the kings were getting impatient too though they were much too dignified to say anything and there they might have stayed till doomsday but that king godfrey's coachman hit on a fine idea he suggested that perhaps one of them was a better king than the other what were his master's virtues would the other coachman kindly tell him the other coachman had his answer already in poetry too and this it was rough to the rough my mighty king the mild with mildness sways masters the good by goodness and the bad with badness pays give place give place o driver such are this monarch's ways mm, said king godfrey's driver tit for tat is all very well but i shouldn't call it virtue to pay out a bad man in his own coin oh well says the other in a huff you can call it vice if you like and i should be very glad to hear all your king's virtues if you laugh at mine certainly said king godfrey's coachman and not to be beaten he did his answer into poetry like the other he conquers wrath by mildness the bad with goodness sways by gifts the miser vanquishes and lies with truth repays give place give place o driver such are this monarch's ways then the other man felt he had met his match i can't cap that said he your master is better than mine and the new king who had not said a word all this time thought it was time to be moving perhaps he had been asleep anyhow he was not at all angry with his coachman but out he got and they let the horses loose and pulled the carriage up on the slope to let king godfrey pass by but king godfrey before he went on gave the other king a little good advice which the king promised to take for in that strange country people used to follow good advice sometimes and then they said good-bye and both went back home again and both of them ruled their countries well until they died the other king we may be sure was all the better for that lesson and i hope godfrey did not become conceited in that strange country as he would have been if he lived here with us end of part four end of the giant crab and other tales from old india retold by w h d rouse